probably most of today's session will be in MATLAB. There's a few things I want to discuss in particular here. Um, mostly just to go back to this slide. So the idea here is that there are many different um, spatial filters, many different um, statistical decompositions that you can apply to multivariate data sets, multi-channel data sets. And you know, when you when you run simulations, when you simulate data, usually simulated data tends not to be super complex. Uh, which is, you know, has its advantages and its uh, limitations. But usually, when you when you simulate data, you simulate data that that falls that is consistent with some assumptions and violates other assumptions. So you'll often find in simulated data that one method works really really well, and the other methods are shit, or at least you know don't really work so well. But that doesn't mean that the other methods that don't work so well aren't fundamentally good methods. It just means that, you know, the, the way that you are simulating the signals is optimized for one particular method. And so the example that you saw in, in this lecture, which you'll also see in the, in the code, is um, I simulated the data to kind of work really well for generalized eigen decomposition. And in fact, ICA was shit uh, at, at this, uh, at the recovering the ground truth. And that certainly doesn't mean that ICA is bad. Um, it just means that this primary assumption of ICA is not met in uh, in the simulate data. So simula simulating data is great. And if you're going into a um, data-oriented career, like in neuroscience um, or in, you know, in uh, data science or, you know, so something uh, else, if it's data-oriented, I definitely recommend you know getting building up the, the skill to be able to simulate data and validate your analysis methods on data because that's really the best way to um, get a like intuitive flexible feel for how analyses work that's much more important in my mind it's much more important to work with simulated data and test your analysis methods than to you know sort of like go through a bunch of math proofs that the uh, that the analysis methods work. Some of these things don't even have proofs. Like, yeah, GED, you can prove that it's the right thing to do. ICA, there, there isn't a proof. It, it's, just an, it's just an algorithm that you apply. Um, anyway, uh, what did I want to say? Oh, yeah, I wanted to say, so in simulations, uh, you, you, you'll often find one of these methods works well. And the other one's not. In, in real data, you know, you don't know the ground truth, which is why we do science in the first place, of course. If we know the ground truth, we wouldn't need to run experiments and analyze data. So what you often find in real data is that uh, you just get kind of different results from different methods. So in real data, you can apply generalized eigen decomposition and ICA to the same data, and you will get you know, you might get kind of similar results or you, you might get qualitatively different results. And it's just not really clear, you know, it's sometimes not really clear what that means or, you know, which method to go with. And what I think is happening, particularly for a complex system like the brain, is that the, the, the two methods are just highlighting different things that are happening at the same time that all get mixed. So you have you know, roughly Gaussian distributed sources and roughly non-Gaussian distributed sources in the brain, ICA is going to find the non-Gaussian sources and ignore the Gaussian sources, and GED will find the, the Gaussian sources that maximize your SNR and not necessarily find these uh, sources. So it's just a, it makes um, science, uh, I don't know what's the right word, spicy or something interesting. Uh, confusing, maddening, infuriating, um, but that's sort of, uh, that's just the reality of, of how it is. Okay, so that was the, the main thing I wanted to um, highlight. Um, I'm, I'm happy to go through questions if you guys have particular questions, um, points about the lecture that were unclear um, or confusing or that you didn't understand or, yeah, just discussion points. Let's see, then, yeah, I mean, as questions come up, um, in this case, it, it can be questions about uh, the, the methods, about the math, 
uh, about the code implementations, anything you have questions about, let me know. The goal here is for you guys to um, understand a bit about the, the lecture. Okay, thank you, Emma. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we start by loading in a data set. Now, whenever you get a new data set, it's a good idea to load it in. And in MATLAB, you just type who's just to see what, what, what the data actually are. So this data, uh, this MAT file has one variable <coughs> called data. You can see it's three-dimensional and it's 64 by 308 by 99. Now, I haven't yet told you anything about this data set. Okay, I guess it's uh, it's here already. But sometimes, you know, if there isn't a really descriptive help file, you're going to need to just um, kind of guess a little bit. Now, if, if you know something about the data, you can already start guessing. So this is 64 EEG channels, um, 308 time points, and 99 repetitions or 99 trials. So... Uh, let's see, and then, you know, it's also interesting just to like explore around randomly. So you can plot data, let's say channel 10, all time points and trial 10, just to get a little bit of a sense, you know, we don't have a time vector here, but just to get a little bit of a sense of what the data look like. You can make images of the data. So image scale data, let's go for, so I guess, you know, um, if you conceptualize this data as a cube, it's a solid cube, so you can't visualize the whole thing at the same time until you go into a four-dimensional, you know, a four-spatial dimensional space, and then you can look at a, a three-dimensional cube and see all of it. Unfortunately, in our in our limited three-dimensional world, three-spatial dimensional world, we can only slice this cube. So, so what I'm going to do is just make an image of this cube, and we can image a couple of slices. So. We can slice through all of the channels and just pick one time point at random somewhere in the middle, and uh, then all of the trials. Oops, and this needs to be uh, like this. So <clears throat> here we see all the channels down here in the in the rows, and all of the trials over here in the columns. So yeah, I mean this is sort of telling us that there's. Some, something happening in you know a couple of trials here that at this time point all of the channels are have a relatively high value so i don't know why that would be that uh, you know that's, that is what it is let's see so we can slice this differently let's do like um, all of the time points and all of the trials from one particular channel that's sometimes an interesting way to go. And actually, I'm going to transpose this. So now we see. Uh, let me see what the time. So I'm going to set the color limit to, to be symmetric. And the boundaries will be 20 microvolts. So this is a, a pretty interesting way to slice the data cube as well. So this is time. And again, these are um, time indices, not time points in milliseconds. And these are trials. And this is from one particular channel. So you see pretty clearly that you know there's something happening at this time point. You see this vertical thing. So that's consistency across the different trials. And then there's something else happening over here. It's also pretty interesting to look to see that you know this response, whatever this is, it seems like it's um, it, it's stronger towards the beginning, the first couple trials, and it gets a little bit weaker towards the towards the later trials. Now maybe from this experiment, uh, there's a reason for that maybe it it shouldn't be that way and you look at this and think that there's something wrong or something weird um but i'm just trying to illustrate to you um how to approach a data set so first by yeah just kind of visualizing in a bunch of different ways okay very good so let's see uh so we're going to work with the trial average and um so here i'm just averaging over the third dimension and then this variable data dim is, is just telling me that there's 64 channels and 308 time points. It's just gonna be a little bit convenient for later. Okay, so what we are going to do now is create a covariance matrix. So covariance matrices are uh, a way of, let's see, where is this? Um, 
showing the representation of all of the linear interactions across all the data sets. So here I have some uh, some channels by time data, and then this is the covariance matrix. So as I mentioned in the video, covariance matrices are amazing. I mean, first of all, they look really cool, but um, they're great because they have a ton of information that's all packed into a very compact representation, um, which is, uh, yeah, so it's it's really, uh, it's convenient. And a lot of analysis methods start off from a covariance matrix, including a lot of statistical methods. So anytime you do um, a, a general linear model or an ANOVA or multiple regression, uh, you're always starting off with a, a, a covariance matrix. Okay, so um, so I showed in the lecture a couple different formulas for creating. Uh, uh, yes, unit. I averaged over trials um, here. So uh, the data start off being three dimensional. Uh, oh, it looks like I actually overwrite the data here. But they started off being. Let me load this. Well, I don't need to load it again. The data started off being three dimensional here. It was channels by time by trials. And um, then I'm averaging over trials. And that's just going to give us the, the ERP, the event related potential. But it's basically just a way of reducing the, the dimensionality. So now we don't have to worry about having a for loop to go over, <clears throat> um, over the different uh, trials. Later on in the lecture, we're going to do another analysis of the um, V1 data that we looked at last week. And there I will preserve all the trials. So there you see that we add another for loop that goes over trials to compute the covariance matrix of each individual trial. OK, so the one I have here is a couple of different ways of computing the uh, covariance matrix. This is the least efficient method but um, sometimes the least efficient method is also nice to start off with because then it's pretty clear. So I have a double loop over channels. So I loop over channels and then I loop over channels again. And then here I mean center the data. So I take the data from one channel and all the time points and I subtract from it the mean of, uh, of that data uh, from uh, over all the time points from, from this channel. <clears throat> and then same thing from, uh, I think sub is probably for like a sub component of the data or something, subset of the data. So for channel I and channel J, and then I'm uh, doing element wise multiplication and sum and dividing by N minus one. And then you loop over um, all of the channels. So in the end, that's gonna give us a covariance matrix, which is 64 by 64, so channels by channels. And I will uh, visualize this for you in a moment. Um, and just to go back to the slides, so that is uh, this formula here. So take uh, the data vector minus the mean of the data vector for that channel. And then this is channel Y. So in the code, I called it Chan I and Chan J. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so uh, mean center of the data, element wise multiply and sum, and then divide by n minus one. So that formula is exactly what I'm doing here in these uh, three lines of code. Okay, so this is one way to compute a covariance matrix. Here's another way to compute the covariance matrix. First, I am uh, mean centering matrix wise. So I'm using this function BSX fun. Uh, which is just, um, uh, it's it, it's also called broadcasting and basically doing what I'm doing here, except you don't need a for loop. I'm, I'm doing it for every column in the matrix all at the same time. And BSX fund takes care of that uh, expansion, so we don't need a loop. So the operation we are implementing is subtraction, and we are subtracting from the data the average of the data. And here I'm taking the average over the second dimension and uh, second dimension corresponds to time. Okay, so this is our mean centered data. And now we can just multiply the data matrix by its transpose and then element wise divide by n minus one. So it turns out that these two lines of code are exactly what all of these lines of code are doing. So you can see this is a little bit more compact, but um, if you are not comfortable with 
linear algebra and broadcasting, then this is a little bit more confusing. Okay. And then the last thing is MATLAB's cove function for covariance. And that's kind of the shortest one. Although, you know, then it's, it's a little bit of a black box. Uh, it's not totally black box. You can actually open up the cove function and you can see, uh, let's see, where is the, all the action happening? Uh, so all the action is happening. So here is computing the denominator, which is n minus one. And I guess it's here. So let's see. So here's the mean centering and then multiply the data matrix by its transpose. So there you go. It's actually really just these two lines of code. All this other, you know, hundred lines of code up here is just um, testing for particular, uh, particular um, situations. Okay. Run that, and I will get back to this in a moment. And now we're going to show all three of those covariance matrices in the same plot. So here you see covariance matrix using loops, using matrix multiplication, and here is using the MATLAB co function. Now it turns out that these two are are, are identical to each other. I'm, I'm not proving that here. You can take my word for it. They certainly look uh, identical. Now this one looks really different, right? And one thing you see is that this is 300 and, and some change um, rows and columns, whereas these are only 60. So, and, and this just visually looks very different. It doesn't even look like it's, you know, like an upsampled version. So what what is the, what's the problem here? Well, it isn't really a problem, but what, what did we do? What did I do differently here? And how would you interpret this matrix? Yeah, that's right, Clement. So it's uh, it's a covariance matrix over time. So here we're computing the um, the covariance or the correlation over all the time points for each pair of channels. <clears throat> and here what we're doing is uh, taking the covariance or the correlation over all of the channels separately at each time point. So then the interpretation here is that you know, these colors are blue, which means cold. Let me add a uh, color bar to this one. So the, these uh, numbers are, are small and, and negative. So that means actually, well, the, the blue is zero. Let me, let me change the uh, color scaling. Let's multiply this by maybe five or something. So now green means uh, zero covariance or, or zero correlation. So this is telling us that over all the time points, uh, all the channels are basically uncorrelated with each other. Um, all, all here, they're all uncorrelated with each other. Now that's actually not surprising because I did, you know, there's some pre-processing involved in this data set. So I did some, uh, some uh, baseline subtraction. So I actually removed all of the, uh, the, the means. So you, you wouldn't really expect much interactions here. And then you can look down here and basically like this thing on a diagonal tells us that at around you know 80 to 90 milliseconds, all the channels are correlated with each other. Now that's not so surprising because this is a uh, there was a visual stimulus that appeared. Uh, oh, these uh, well these labels are incorrect. This is actually time points. Uh, a visual stimulus appeared somewhere around here. So then you see you know a lot of the what you see at the scalp is going to be strongly correlated. So anyway, there's nothing particularly wrong with this covariance matrix. And it's certainly valid to do decompositions over time instead of over space. Uh, but usually, that's that's really not what we're looking for. So what we need to do is actually just transpose the data. So the MATLAB co function is, by default, computing the covariance over the, uh, over the columns. So we're going to transpose this matrix so that uh, it becomes 300 by 60, which means that the rows are in the columns. So, and then I can rerun that code here. And now you can see all of these three are identical. OK, so that's about a covariance matrix. Um, next, what we're going to do is uh, simulate some data, unless anyone has any questions about the covariance matrices. Um, so for Yuda's question, yes, MATLAB starts indexing at one, like normal human beings. Uh, <laughs> well, that's uh, that's debatable, Yuda. Whether that's annoying, but uh, yeah, it is something to to know. You find very often that um, 
the more math oriented programming languages like MATLAB and Julia do one indexing and the more like um, uh, like kind of uh, developer uh, engineering um, uh, languages like Python and C do zero indexing. I think Java also does zero indexing. Um, so it's just something you have to get used to. Um, let's see, what do the matrices tell us about the channels? Yeah, good question. Um, so basically, we can go back to to looking at these. Did I actually include these slides in the lecture? I forget whether I, I cut out a few slides from the lecture. Okay. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I'll... I'll, I'll present these slides quickly. So looking at uh, covariance matrices is pretty informative. Um, so, so what I'm going to do now is show a couple of slides that are um, showing different kinds of features that you might see in covariance matrices. First of all, keep in mind that uh, the way to interpret covariance matrices element-wise is that each element is the correlation, the unscaled correlation between this channel and this channel. So it's each pair of channels. Now that means that the diagonal is, uh, in a correlation matrix, the diagonal is the correlation between each channel with itself. So if this were a covariance, uh, uh, sorry, a correlation matrix, what would you expect to see on the diagonals? Uh, yeah, only red, in particular the number one, right? So every channel is perfectly correlated with itself. But a covariance matrix, uh, you don't necessarily see uh, that the diagonal is prominent. And that's because uh, the covariance matrix is not scaled in the way that a correlation is scaled. So the covariance is still in the same, uh, the, the range of the data, which means that uh, the diagonal actually tells you about the variance of each individual channel. So that you can see here. So this channel here, this, this cyan channel, See, this is like pretty flat, right? So there's some noise, but it doesn't really do a whole lot. So its variance is relatively small, whereas this yellow channel is going to have higher variance, higher standard deviation, because it has all this little noise stuff, but it's also just going up and down more. So it deviates away from the average value more. So its variance is going to be higher. So the, um, the diagonal of a covariance matrix tells you about the, the amount of variability in each channel individually, totally separate from how that channel may or may not relate to all of the other channels in the data set. So um, this tells, so a, a plot that looks something like this tells you that the variance is roughly equivalent to the covariance. And here, this, this uh, uh, kind of covariance matrix would tell you that the variance is actually much higher than the covariance. So this means that all the individual channels are just totally wild. They're going off, you know, they're to going totally nuts. Uh, but the relationship between the between all the pairs of channels is is smaller than the amount of variability in the channels per se. So that's something you could see in the covariance matrix. Um, this one is a little bit trickier to interpret, but if you see a, a covariance matrix that looks like this, now it looks like you know, you don't see this like beautiful structure that you see here. So it could be that there isn't as much spatial structure in the, the data here compared to here. Um, but you do have to be a little bit mindful, you know, because it looks like the, the correlations across all the channels is just kind of random. But you do have to be a bit mindful that seeing, you know, sort of visually compelling structure in a covariance matrix depends on the channels being uh, meaningfully spatially organized relative to each other. So for example, this covariance matrix is literally exactly the same data as this one. I just randomized the order of the channels. So it looks like it's it's it, it looks like there's nothing compelling here, but uh, but it's actually just that the channels are sorted. So that's why it's often useful in, in data, if you're gonna be working with covariance matrices to sort the, the channel order in some kind of meaningful physical spatial way. Uh, let's see, so then, you know, you could also see something like 
this, where it looks like there's one row and also one column uh, that has really weak uh, or, or basically no correlations, also no, no variance. Now, this also could be a channel order issue because here you see that uh, channel one has uh, basically no covariance with, uh, has like zero covariance with all the other channels. So it could be a channel order. But the tricky thing or the, the sort of hint here is that uh, this channel also has zero variance. So uh, so, so if you see a, a, a covariance matrix like this in your data, then I would look at this channel and it seems like this channel is dead. This, there's something wrong with this channel. So probably you just want to remove it from your data. Um, Likewise, this is also uh, pretty clear that, you know, if you see uh, a column and a row that is uh, very unusual, it, its patterns of covariance is very different from all the other channels, then that probably indicates that it's a bad channel. In this case, I just replaced one channel with high amplitude random noise. So, uh, but again, if I saw a covariance matrix like this, it could be plausible, maybe if this channel is like far away, if it's in a different brain region or something, but probably th this is a bad channel and you want to remove it from your data. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers your question. So I guess the thing is that uh, these covariance matrices have a ton of information in them because there's a lot of, of in, you know, in real data, there's a lot of like layers that are feeding onto the covariance matrix. So just what you see visually is not necessarily everything that there is here because there's there's a lot of patterns that are embedded into these matrices that are not necessarily visually obvious and that's uh what eigen decomposition is going to do basically eigen decomposition will find all of these separate layers and pull them apart um <clears throat> Yeah, so Nathan asks, uh, are there ways to order the channel? Yeah, so you can do uh, like um, uh, uh, some kind of uh, clustering algorithm, like uh, a dendrogram is a way of um, uh, forming hierarchical clusters to group channels that look similar in terms of their covariance or uh, Euclidean distance or, or some measure of, uh, of, of distance or similarity. Um, so there are ways. If this is in, you know, in, in neuroscience data, you could actually just do it spatially, like, you know, have uh, these are like uh, EEG channels that are physically close to each other, and these are EEG channels that are farther apart from each other. So, but yeah, in the end, you know, I mean, it's during data inspection and cleaning, it's good to eyeball the covariance matrices. But like I said, in the end, you know, you could have a matrix a covariance matrix that actually has like maybe six distinct patterns that are all overlaying on top of each other. And you can't uh, isolate them by eye. You need some math tricks to do that. Okay. Uh, good questions. Thank you for, for participating. Uh, let's see. So now I'm going to uh, start with the data simulation. So I hope this picture was was clear enough in the slides. But basically, now that I rotate it, you can see that it. I hope you can see that it's a brain. So there's a dot for each dipole, and this is like the the prefrontal cortex here. This is the dorsal surface here. Are the the temporal poles sticking out. So like this would be like the amygdala is here, and this would be uh, the occipital lobe, parietal cortex. The spine would go down here, and so on. So we have all these dipoles, 2,000 dipoles in the brain, and I'm picking this one. And so the idea is that all of these dipoles are projecting their electrical activity out to the scalp, and we can measure them from uh, the electrodes. And uh, they all point in different directions. They all point uh, to the, um, they'll project to the scalp in different ways. And so what we're doing here, what we're looking at here is, um, basically, just the uh, where is this line of code? The uh, the topographical map of the uh, so I'll talk about this in a minute. But uh, the projection from the dipole just from one particular location, and the, so location one hundred nine happens to be this one. So and all the other dipoles are silent. So if your entire brain is not making any activity, and then you have one dipole here in parietal cortex that is active, 
and we measured EEG, then the EEG scalp map would look like this. So it projects really strongly to these electrodes because they're closest, and it also continues to project to, you know, in theory, all the electrodes, but the, um, the, the, the field strength weakens as a, um, a square root function of distance, or inverse square of distance. And uh, yeah, so then the red line here is like the dipole activity that I simulated, and the um, this uh, this noisy line is what we measure at EEG electrode 31. So this is mixing noise together from all the electrodes. So just to take a little bit of mystery out of this. So let's see. So this is a data set that has, uh, is it, is it, oh no, it's in this variable, LF. So LF is for lead field. Um, a lead field is another term for the, uh, the the physical, the biophysical forward model that tells you how to get from each individual dipole to all 64 channels. Um, so you can see we have, we have this gain matrix, which is, uh, it's basically going from 2004 dipoles to 64 electrodes. And the three in the middle here is because you can simulate dipole um, with three orientations. So um, X, Y, Z orientation. So you can think of, I don't, do you guys actually see me as well or you only see the screen? Both, okay, great. So if you hold out your hand like this, I don't know if you've, if you've made these like 3D coordinate axes, but if you hold out your hand like this, then you can imagine that a dipole is kind of positioned you know, it, it's not going to be positioned in uh, along only one axis. So it's going to go, yeah, like with some weird orientation. So then to get the actual dipole, uh, you have to um, uh, make a, a model of the, um, the, 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 the normal to the uh, cortical surface. So the cortical surface is folded. And then you have uh, the dipole being exactly perpendicular to the folding of the cortex. So you need all three um, cardinal directions. And that's basically what this does. So I, I uh, normalize the gain function. Um, and yeah, that, that just kind of makes it more convenient because now we have uh, one orientation instead of having to worry about all three orientations. So it just simplifies things a little bit. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, so then the idea, is, the way this simulation works is we have um, 2,000 dipoles in the brain and we simulate um, data, we produce data at each of those dipoles, and then we project each of those dipoles out to the 64 channels. So, and that's done by just a, a matrix multiplication. So it's, it's, the math is pretty simple. Okay, so then the way that I simulated the data here is by, um, so I, I generate this matrix called dipole data. It's 2000 by 1000, so 2000 dipoles, 1000 time points. And uh, it starts off as being just pure noise. Um, and then what I do is replace one of the dipole activities only for the second half of the time series with a sine wave at 10 hertz. So you see it's uh, sine of 2 pi f, and then this is t, our time vector here. And then, yeah, this is like amplitude and the amplitude of the noise. This stuff is, is pretty arbitrary. Um, it, it's kind of neat in the code to see, um, I don't think I will do this today, but you can do this on your own, to see, basically test the, the limits of uh, the generalized eigenvalue composition. So with this level of signal and this level of noise, the generalized eigenvalue composition is amazing. It's, it's remarkable how, how well it works. But of course, you can, you can increase the noise and or decrease the amplitude of the signal, and you will find that generalized eigenvalue composition also breaks down at some point. So there's no, uh, there's no silver, no magic bullets here. Uh, let's see. OK, very good. So now we have our simulated data. And the way that, you know, the sort of philosophy of simulating data is that uh, you simulate the ground truth data and then you create an environment that's like what your real data contain. So, you know, there are these equivalent dipoles in the brain, but we don't actually measure them directly. 
uh, so we, 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 we model the projection out to the scalp, and then we only analyze the data at the scalp level. We don't analyze the dipole data. So we analyze the scalp data, and then the question is, how well can we reconstruct what we know is the ground truth? And of course, in real data, you don't know what the ground truth is, but here we do know what the ground truth is. It's exactly this red line. So we can quantify, uh, well, here we're only doing this qualitatively, but we can also uh, quantify exactly how well our reconstructed data from our spatial filtering methods can reconstruct uh, the, the original ground truth data. So, um, so that's the idea. So we simulate the data. And now what we're going to do is apply the three different methods that I discussed. So um, uh, PCA and um, GED and ICA. So now I would like you to tell me what are some ways that you could, so, so I discussed in the lecture that for generalized eigenic composition, you create two covariance matrices and you pit them against each other. So um, what are some features of the data that you would use to create the S and the R covariance matrices? So the signal covariance matrix and the R covariance matrix. There's at least two correct answers and, and possibly even more, so. So for the S, just the time window from 0.45 seconds to one, and then for the noise, the other end of that. Yeah, great. So that's kind of the first thing you, you think of. Uh, so yeah, that, that's correct. So you could take the, the, the data from this time window for the um, S covariance matrix and the data from this time window for the R covariance matrix. And that's also what, what you did say. Any other ideas? Um, interesting comment, Daniel. So if we wanted to do uh, statistics, if we wanted to run some inferential statistics, we uh, it certainly would be a good idea to shuffle uh, the data and take um, R matrices from randomly selected uh, time windows and then compare them. That would be a good way to uh, attach a p-value to our uh, to our results. Yeah, interesting thought, Emma, um, about spatial. Um, however, what we want to do for this, um, this for spatial filtering is basically use all of the channels. So we want to take all 64 channels. Also, because we are directly comparing two covariance matrices, um, the order of, so the, the channels and the ordering of the channels needs to be exactly the same. And that is because what the generalized eigendecomposition is going to do is look at these two matrices and ask, what are the patterns that uh, differentiate, that best separate these two matrices? Now here, it's obviously this one channel, but here, um, remember, you know, I said these are exactly the same data. I just swapped the channel order. But if you are the eigen decomposition, you look at these two matrices and you say, huh, well, what differs between these two channels? Yeah, this one, they're, they're really different. Okay, that makes sense. How about like thinking about something from last week, incorporating ideas uh, that we discussed last week about spectral uh, separation to, to try and create the SNR matrices here. Yeah, that's right, you did. So uh, what you could do is um, narrow band filter the data at around 10 Hertz and use, and then take the covariance matrix of the filtered data. Um, and that would be your S matrix. And then you could either narrow band filter at a different frequency or not filter at all and take the covariance matrix of the broadband data. Um, and that would be the covariance for R. Now, what's interesting about that approach is you could actually use the, um, uh, the, the same time window for both covariance matrices. So you could actually just ignore uh, the first 500 milliseconds and just take the data from, from this time window here, filtered in around 10 hertz for S, and let's say just the broadband uh, taken for the R matrix. That's a pretty interesting approach to think about for real um, data analysis applications, because then uh, you have all any like you know, assuming this is like data from a, a task, all of the the cognitive task related features are exactly the same. So, you know, any anything the subject is looking at or listening to, or button presses or decisions they're making, 
all of that stuff is the same. And the matrices, the covariance matrices would differ only in terms of their spectral content. So it's a, it's a way of, of mixing um, uh, spectral decomposition or spectral separation and also spatial, spatial separation. All right, very good. So here um, I do the first option we had. So I take the, um, I isolate the data from the first 500 time points and then uh, mean center compute the covariance matrix. And here I take, so that's, I call that cove R. And then here I take the data from the second uh, 500 uh, time points, mean center, and then compute its covariance matrix S. So, and we look at those and it's pretty remarkable that those two covariance matrices look overall really, really similar. I mean, they look so similar that you might even be tempted to think I made a bug you know, that, that there's a bug in the code. So it's useful to go back and check that these really are different variable names and those variable names really do come from uh, different features of the data, in this case, different temporal segments. So uh, also just to illustrate that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good to visualize your data and be critical and always uh, check in case you made um, uh, possible mistakes. So now if you look carefully at these, you see that they're not identical. Like here you see quite some difference and there's probably some other points where you can find a difference. So this is a really interesting case because both of these matrices look really, really similar to each other. Um, but the uh, eigenvalue composition is going to find the patterns in these two matrices that, uh, that make them different from each other. So why do they, why do they look so similar to each other? Any ideas? Yeah, you, know, you might think that I'm even going to, let's do a, a correlation. This this would be pretty interesting. Plot cove S, and I'm uh, vectorizing it here just to convert the matrix into a really long vector by cove R. And let's make these, uh, how about magenta circles? So here you see X is squared. Um, so these are super duper strongly correlated with each other. And let's, I'm now even curious to see what the correlation coefficient is. So they're correlated at 0.993. That is pretty fucking strongly correlated. So, uh, so what do you guys think? Why, why are these two uh, matrices so incredibly similar to each other? That may be a little surprising, right? Because it looks like they should be quite different based on how I simulated the time series. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, there is noise that is constant, but you know the noise is you know if we would just compute the covariance matrix of noise, it would look like this. So let's say you know I'll say the, um, d equals rand n. Let's do like uh, twenty channels by a thousand time points, and now I will show the covariance matrix of d and. Uh, it doesn't look like it has a lot of uh, structure. In fact, these are basically just you know uh, zeros plus rounding error. So the the noise is actually different on each time point and at each channel. Okay, so the reason why these two covariance matrices look really similar is because the uh, most of the variance in this data set in the channel data set is driven by the physics of this forward model. So the forward model is a physical model that tells us how to get from each dipole to each channel. And there are um, constraints built into that model that are governed by like volume conduction and current spread um, through, the, through brain tissue and across the scalp and so on. So most of what you see happen, you know, the, the, the effect of volume conduction is so powerful that that is dominating the overall signal in the um, in in the channel data set. I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit uh, weird to wrap your head around, but basically, just getting the signal from inside the brain to outside the brain that already is uh, is such a like structured, organized. Um, uh, part of, of the, the, the process of generating the, the data or getting from the, the brain to the scalp. But that really dominates everything. 
And, and then just this, you know, this little wiggle that's relatively small compared to the overall effect of volume conduction. Hmm. I'm not sure what you mean by graft the algorithm. Uh, but it is true that um, the generalized eigenvalue composition is basically going to try to find out what is separate, separable between these two matrices. Okay, good. Well, if it comes back to you, feel free to uh, post again. Okay, so all of that said, that's how we create our two covariance matrices. Now we're going to um, apply these different methods. So we're going to start off with PCA. And you can see PCA is going to take the eigen decomposition. And now I'm um, averaging both of these covariance matrices together. So we're not separating the covariance matrices. We're just looking for structure in the covariance matrices. And in this case, we don't have any particular reason to select one or the other. So we just average them together. Um, and you might be thinking that I'm missing a division by two, but that's just an arbitrary scaling factor. Uh, so you don't actually need that. Okay, so then this is, let me see, just very quickly to remind you of what we're doing here. So I gave you this kind of step-by-step -step instructions for how to compute a PCA. So the covariance matrix of the data we computed, um, and then here we're taking the eigen decomposition, and then, yeah, there's a little bit of math, and uh, then we sort the results of the eigen decomposition, and uh, yeah, compute the, um, the the component time series and uh, yeah, the rest of the stuff. So let's see. So here we take the um, eigen decomposition, and we can look at these results. So we can make an image of the eigen vectors matrix, and there isn't really a whole lot to see in the eigen vectors matrix, except you can. So the eigen vectors are in the columns, and if you look at the the rightmost column, I don't know how well you can see this on your screen, but it looks like the rightmost column has some like structure. And as you get to later components, it starts looking more like noise, it just more looks more like fuzz. And then we have the eigenvalues matrix. So it looks like it's all blue. It's actually a diagonal matrix, which means that all the off diagonal elements are zeros and all the diagonal elements contain the eigenvalues. Um, the, the reason why uh, it's in a matrix and not a vector is because of uh, something called diagonalization, which uh, is, uh, well, it, it doesn't really matter for these purposes. Okay, so we can make a plot of the diagonal elements of the eigenvalues. Um, so then you see these are actually, um, these are uh, now ascending. So they start off small and they get bigger and bigger. Now, there's no intrinsic sorting of eigenvalues and uh, the eigenvalues of a matrix is, is just a collection of numbers there, there's no real way to sort them um they uh or, or that is say that they don't have any like mathematically intrinsic sorting from the algorithm with symmetric matrices they tend to come out sorted like this but that's has more to do with the way that um that uh that that Fortran that these libraries uh, that MATLAB is calling um, estimate the eigenvalues. So there's there's really no guarantee that the you know that the the last eigenvalue is going to be the largest. So that's why you need to sort them explicitly. And then here I sort them descending. And that's really just for convenience, um, because then uh, it's convenient because uh, oops, it's convenient because um, then the first element is the the largest. So otherwise, you know, that, that's kind of arbitrary. Okay, anyway, uh, let's run all this code. So now we see uh, the eigenvalues from the PCA. And actually in the in the um, slide, I said you could convert these into percent change. And here I'm just dividing it by the maximum value. It's, it's all sort of arbitrary. So this just sets the top value to be one. Uh, but we can do something like evals equals 100 times evals divided by the sum of evals. So this uh, converts to percent change. And let me get rid of this. So now you see the first component uh, captures 44% of the variance. The next component captures 
27% of the variance of the signal and so on. And then these components are tiny. They're not really explaining any variance. Okay, and then uh, let's see. So here's the component time series. So you take um, the, the first eigenvector. So this is the eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue. And then uh, that gets um, multiplied by, so transposed and then multiplied by the data. So um, th this is also computing an inner product in here. So if you're not familiar with linear algebra, then it might be a little mysterious what this line of code is actually doing. So therefore, let me go to uh, this slide here. Uh, no, let me go to this slide here. Oh, wait, uh, maybe this one is better. OK. So, oh, wait, that's the same slide, just smaller. OK. Um, so we have the, the data time series. So this is EEG.data, right? It's channels and then time points. And then uh, the W here comes from the eigenvector. So we have 64 channels, and the eigenvector has 64 elements. So you take uh, element one from the eigenvector, and, and that's just a single number. And then you multiply that by this entire time series. So that's just a single number times this whole time series. And then there's a different number that multiplies this time series and so on. And then you sum up all of those like weighted time series or modulated time series from each of the channels. Um, and then you sum them all up, and that gives you one single time series. And that is uh, basically what this line of code does. This is just, you, you could also put this in a for loop, but this is a little more compact. OK, uh, then this is some arbitrary scaling, just so it looks good in the plot. OK, let's see. So and then uh, yeah, the, the, then we have the, 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 the forward model of the filter. So this is basically what the, the top component looks like from the perspective of the filter. So um, it doesn't really do a very good job. Now, maybe you're thinking, you know, hey, Mike, this is totally unfair because you, in you included both these covariance matrices. So we can rerun it just with the S covariance matrix. But it turns out that has basically a negligible effect. That's almost no effect whatsoever. So, and that you see uh, here. So the PCA still does not do a good job of recovering the ground truth. And the reason for that is because, oh, the figure is gone now, but that's because the S and the R covariance matrices are so incredibly similar to each other. So essentially this PCA isn't really telling us about this dynamic. That's what we want. That's what we want PCA to do. But actually PCA is just looking at these covariance matrices and saying, what is, you know, what's like the most important thing happening in this covariance matrix? And the most important thing happening in this covariance matrix for EEG turns out just to be, you know, the effect of, of volume conduction and current spread. So that's one uh, reason why PCA um, tends not to produce very good results in, um, in uh, uh, electrophysiology data. OK, let's see. Um, any questions about PCA? OK, PCA is boring. Nobody cares about it. So we all want to see GED. OK, so now uh, it's interesting to see that all of this code here for the generalized eigen decomposition is almost exactly the same as for PCA. Really, the only difference is is a comma instead of a plus sign. So that's really, uh, it's really, it's remarkable. You know, it's one character and it makes a huge difference. Okay, now the order is important here. So let's run this. Um, and here we see uh, one component is ginormous and the rest of them are all tiny. So essentially this is like the noise spectrum here. You can think of this as like sorted noise. This is sorted noise. And then this is, uh, well, it's clearly popping out from this um, distribution of sorted noise. You can also see this. Let's see if I just get rid of this. We can see what the raw eigenvalues are. And uh, maybe a, a better way to do this is, um, let me just try it this way, plus um, evals. Now we look, hmm, I don't know, that's the same thing. What did I want to do? Maybe 
kind of too few for a, a histogram. Okay. I guess the, the point I wanted to make is that um, these should all be distributed around one. Um, and that is because of the equation for generalized eigen decomposition, which is this. So now um, S and when S and R are equal to each other, uh, along, you know, pointing in direction W, then uh, this ratio is one. So uh, what we find in, in this simulated data set is that there is one direction, there is one W where this ratio is really large and the generalized eigen decomposition finds that. And then that ratio, that multivariate power ratio is lambda is the eigenvalue. And then it turns out that all the other directions in the data set in the 64 channel uh, or 64 dimensional space, in all of those other dimensions, S and R are just kind of a, a, a sphere in those directions. They're just, it's just clouds that are the same size. So all the other ways of pointing through the data space have um, equal variance in S and R. So then the ratios all go to one. And now it's not going to be exactly one because we have a bunch of random noise and only um, 500 time points in each matrix. So, uh, so essentially you're going to get noise um, uh, or, or sorted values. Maybe, maybe the way to do this would be to draw a one on here. Let's see. Hold on, plot. Let's go from uh, zero to 20, zero to 21. And the Y coordinate is going to be one. And I'll make this a thick red line. Yeah. So, um, so the rest of this is basically just sorted noise. So it should be one, uh, but then because of some random noise, it's gonna like randomly point in different directions. Um, or yeah, you're gonna be able to find specific directions in pure noise where S happens to be a little bit more variable than R. And someone earlier asked, it was Daniel, who asked if we could shuffle the time point. So this would be um, an appropriate situation for shuffling the data. And you could shuffle uh, the, the, the data um, time series or, or what window you, you choose for baseline, let's say, a thousand times. And you rerun eigen the generalized eigen decomposition a thousand times. Um, and then you would get a distribution of 1,000 maximum eigenvalues in noise, which you would expect to be somewhere around here. So then that would be your um, threshold. And you would say anything above that threshold is, you know, statistically reliable and below it is, is the empirical noise spectrum. Okay, anyway, um, so the rest of this code, oh yeah, that was the other thing. Well, okay, let me show you this. So then we see that, um, the, the ground truth and the uh, filter forward model look really, really similar to each other. And you also see that the, um, the, the generalized eigen decomposition component time series, which is exactly the same as how we computed it for, um, for the PCA, uh, which is, oh yeah, it's here. So it's still just the eigenvectors times the, the data. Um, and that looks looks really good. It's still a little uh, noisy, so it's not a perfect separation, but um, overall, it's uh, it's quite good. And what did I want to say? Oh, right, yeah. So um, the order into the eig function tells you ab about uh, the the numerator versus the denominator of that equation, uh, which is called the the rally quotient that I showed in the slide. So if we were to reverse this now. Um, MATLAB is trying to say, what are the directions where R is more powerful than S, is more vari has uh, more variance than S? So here, this is really just sorted noise. You, you don't see anything here. Um, and that's because, uh, I, so this is pretty interesting to look at here. So you can see R is actually noisier than S. But we we know the ground truth. We simulated these data. So we know that this is just maximizing noise. This is overfitting noise, basically. I, I guess you guys have learned about the terms like overfitting and things from uh, a statistics or machine learning uh, lecture. 
And I'm curious what the, uh, yeah, so the forward model also looks like junk. And it'll also be interesting to, you know, to rerun this many times. Um, so if you, if you simulated exactly, you know, run exactly the same code, I think I'll even do that here. So let's run um, exactly the same code. So the signal is now identical, but of course the noise is going to be different because it's just a different instantiation of random noise. Recompute the covariance matrices, and we don't need to worry about the PCA again. Uh, but I do want to run this generalized eigen composition again, except now, so let's see, that was in figure four. So now I'm gonna change this to figure five. And yeah, that's all fine, okay. So now rerun exactly the same code without changing anything. And now you can see yeah, the, the eigenspectra look a bit different and the topography looks totally different, right? And the, the reason why the topographies look totally different here is because we are literally just fitting noise. This is just random directions in a, a 64 dimensional space of, of noise. And, uh, yeah, and, and so, yeah, I mean, interesting to see that it, it still looks sensible right? It's kind of like smooth. This one in particular looks beautiful. This is like some really great parietal thing, but this is just um, picking up on uh, on uh, the, the, the volume conduction that's intrinsic from this forward modeling. Yeah. So partly I'm, I'm going into all this because what I, I want you guys to get out of my uh, lectures is not just, you know, like a, a, a bulleted, a bullet point list of different data analysis methods and things like that. But I want to give you a bit of a sense of how to work with data, how to, in this case, simulate data, but also just like how to, yeah, when you're working with data, you know, I noticed like some people are, are timid with data. They're afraid of their data, but that's the wrong way to be. You have to be like the master of your data. You have to take a, a very like, assertive and and curious and uh, and uh, and um, almost aggressive approach to looking at your data and trying out a lot of different things, changing parameters and so on. Okay, that's why simulating data is is great because you can do all of that stuff. You can control what's really happening in the ground truth, which you can't do uh, in the real world. So uh, let's see. Okay, so then, um, oh yeah, so any questions about Generalize eigen composition before we move to PCA. Yeah, the code is, oh, it's actually not on Brightspace, but it's already on my website. I sent out the link. Um, it's the same mat file that, uh, that uh, so this code was already in the mat file. It's called Cohen ANT class two. And by the way, I'm going to send, um, I can, maybe I'll already send it today. There's another um, version of that zip file where I've replaced these files with something else. Uh, let me, let me find that real quick. Um, so I'm going to give you um, another zip file that um, has uh, MATLAB files that are almost the same as for this week and last week. But you can see there's a lot of red lines here. So there's a lot of errors. So there's things that are missing here. And uh, I already went through this, but now it, it's empty. So this is um, an opportunity for you to uh, to fill in this code. And you, you, know, you can cheat, right? Because you have all the answers right here. But... Um, if you're curious, this is you know not something you would you would turn in. This is just for your own um, your own like edification. Uh, then yeah, you can you can go through this code and fix everything that's that's wrong. Fix all these errors in here. So I, I will send that to you later today. Okay. So um, any other questions? Great, okay, so then we do the ICA. Um, there's probably like a dozen different um, ICA algorithms that are out there. 
some of them take a little bit longer. Some of them take a little bit uh, are a bit faster. Um, and they, they kind of rely on, they key on different methods. They optimize slightly different things. So it can be, I mean, they're all sort of looking for non-Gaussianity, but some of them do that based on uh, um, minimizing mutual information between components. Some of them do that by maximizing uh, kurtosis, which is a, a feature of a, of a distribution. Um, and uh, yes, they, so different ICA algorithms work slightly differently and will, will give slightly different results. Um, here I'm using this method called JADE, which is like a joint approximation of diagonalized eigen I forget what it stands for actually, but um, what I like about JADE for uh, for teaching is that it's, it's fast, it runs really fast, and it's also uh, deterministic in the sense that every time you rerun the code, it gives you exactly the same results. Other ICA algorithms start off with uh, random weights. So each time you rerun the code, you can actually get a different decomposition, uh, particularly in a situation like this, where you have um, uh, random, uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, where the, the data are not very complex. And uh, so, so I have uh, the J, so I input uh, the data, and then it's number 20. So this means that I'm going to do um, 20, extract only 20 components out of the data, even though in theory we could extract 64 because it's 64 dimensional. So the way that, that Jade actually um, does this is um, it first does a principal components analysis and that you see here. So take the data. So here it's calling the data matrix X, um, subtract the average. Uh, so mean center the data. And then you can see here it's computing the eigen decomposition of the data matrix by its transpose divided by the number of time points. So you already know that this is the covariance matrix. And then here it sorts the um, eigenvalues. And um, uh, yeah, then let's see. Well, OK, so it's also doing some, some whitening. But so it's just taking the first n uh, components of the principal components analysis. So it's already neat to see that, you know, although the variable names are different, and I don't know what PALS is for, it, it must be French. Any of you guys uh, French speakers? Is that a French word? It might be something like eigenvalue or power or something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so it's pretty neat that um, uh, after just going through my lecture, you can already kind of understand some of this. Um, pretty serious code that uh, people are are uh, used like in actual production. Oh, by the way, the Jade algorithm is is pretty is famous because it was used um, to like uncover some features of the, the the structure of the the universe, the large scale structure of the universe. They took all these um, different images from uh, like re resulting from like all this. Um, different images of the cosmic uh, the background radiation that um, is residual from the Big Bang. And then they use the Jade algorithm to do an ICA over all of those different um, images and extract some uh, some structures. So if you're curious about that, you can, you can read about it uh, online. Anyway, uh, let's see. So, uh, so we do PCA and then down to 20 components, and then we do the ICA on the first 20 principal components, which is, so this was the, the PCA result. So uh, in fact, it's everything I'm plotting here. So do the um, ICA just on the top, you know, 20 components there. Okay, and then uh, the code here looks a little bit different from the code for the eigen decomposition, uh, but the concept is, is the same. So we still have the independent component vector and the top component and then that's multiplying the data. It's not transposed here because it comes out in a different orientation, but it's it's still the uh, a column vector. Um, and yeah, so some of this stuff looks slightly different, but uh, the the principle is the same. Okay, so you can also see ICA is an iterative algorithm, so it has to sweep through the data multiple times. So um, it's you know a little bit like uh, like k-means clustering is also an iterative algorithm, um, so it's it's running through the data multiple times and it's optimizing the set of weights. 
so here's what ICA looks like. In fact, you know, this kind of looks like like uh, what I intentionally flipped the um, uh, the signal to be uh, the wrong way, uh, or the the, the R and S uh, covariance matrices to be backwards. And this looks like shit. And this is obviously terrible. This this IC independent component time series looks awful. Um, as I mentioned in the lecture and also in the beginning of this lecture, uh, that you know I do not want you to conclude that. ICA is terrible for EEG data. In fact, if any of you guys um, work with EEG data or plan to work with uh, EEG data, basically ICA is used in like probably 99.9% .9 of EEG papers um, to identify uh, blinks and other um, sources of uh, non-brain artifacts. So it, it's just about this, the way that I set up this simulation that ICA is not really doing a great job. Okay, so let's see. All right, so now that is the end of uh, the simulated data. So now we are gonna start working with some real data. This is the, the mouse V1 data that we also uh, looked at a bit last week. That was the data set that has this um, little burst of uh, gamma. And then we did a time frequency analysis and you saw that there was like, the 40 hertz gamma, and then um, at the second stimulus onset, you see this higher frequency gamma at like 60 hertz, and then it kind of slows down to 50 hertz, whatever that was. Okay, so load in the data. And again, we'll just, I'll type who's here just so we can have a quick look at, at what we see. So CSD, that stands for um, current source density. Uh, it's basically um, actually a different kind of spatial filter that has already been applied to the voltage data. And that is 16 by 1500 by 200. So um, the, and the, the, or, the order of the matrices is the same as for the previous data we were working with. So 16 channels, 1500 time points, and 200 trials. And then we have a really bizarre sampling rate of like 762.9395. <laughs> And then uh, this time vector here. So we can plot uh, time vec by, um, we can, let's look at the average of CSD for, someone give me a channel. What's your favorite number between one and 16? Or who is the one who didn't like uh, that MATLAB does one coding? Yeah, Udit, okay. So Udit, I'm actually gonna write channel eight because I'm assuming that you prefer zero uh, coding. So I think your seven actually starts counting at zero. <laughs> anyway, uh, so average over, now what, what makes more sense to average over? Obviously it doesn't make sense to average over the first dimension because that's, we only have one thing there. There's only one element there. Does it make more sense to average over the second dimension or over the third dimension? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, we want to average over trials, which is the third dimension. In fact, we can't even average over the second dimension because now this average here, that is uh, 200 elements. So this is actually um, uh, averaging over all the time points for each of 200 trials, which, uh, I mean, that's, you know, that that's not, um, uh, oops, that's, that's not bad on its own. That can be interesting uh, to see you know, if there's like, let's say one trial with really bad data, maybe I will I'll square this. So um, so we look at this, let me plot it uh, like this. So you know, this is telling us that trial uh, 15 has really high variance. So this could be interesting. Maybe this trial is, uh, it looks like it could be an outlier. Maybe there's some artifact on this trial or something like that. So it's not that averaging over time is meaningless, uh, but we want to average over um, trials, in this case, to see the ERP. And this is basically what the plot looks like that uh, we saw um, last week. So here we have uh, the stimulus onset and then the, uh, the contrast reversal here at 0.5. But now, you know, we can also uh, look at these data in a different way. We can, we can slice this cube in different ways. So let's say, image SC 
CSD, I think I'll need to squeeze this. Uh, let's look at um, uh, channel eight and then all time points and all trials. And I think I'll do time spec. Oops, let me like this. So this is, hmm, let's see. Uh, let me see what the color scaling is here. Yeah, okay, so now what we have here is all of the trials down here on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So then what you want to, you know, what you want to look for is like some consistency, some vertical uh, lines over here. And it's, it's actually kind of hard to see. So this looks pretty consistent. This is like the offset response. And I don't know how well you can see it on your screen, but I see that there's a lot of like high frequency oscillations. So there's a lot of gamma happening here and also happening here. But it actually looks like a lot of that is um, like non-phase lock, we would call this. So it, the timing is slightly different on each trial. So that's pretty interesting. In fact, if you do this again with the um, with a time frequency decomposition, you would see like if you would plot make an image like this for uh, gamma power, that looks really, really consistent. But here you have the broadband signal. So you have all of this stuff mixed together, all these different frequencies, um, all these different like spectral sources in the data are mixed together. So this plot uh, actually doesn't really, it doesn't look as pretty as the real consistency that's actually in all of the data over, over trials. Okay, so that's one way of looking at the data. Um, here is another way, which is to, to, so we could also make an image of this, but because it's only 16 channels, we could just plot them all out. So uh, this is the ERP, this is the average over all the trials, and then each line corresponds to a channel. And this channel is actually outside the brain. And then in here, we get to like uh, layer one and layer two and layer three. This is around layer four here. And then we have layer five and six down here. And the, the lowest channel is in the hippocampus. So this blue line is actually not even in V1. You can see it looks different. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's in a totally different brain region. So uh, it's knowing that information um, it's not that surprising that it looks quite different from its neighbor, even though they are, um, you know, like the uh, the physical distance in terms of microns is the same between each pair of channels, but we're piercing different brain structures so that um, time series will look quite different. Okay, so then um, here you see the, uh, the, the, the phase reversal time and then the stimulus offset time. So... And then what we are going to do is compute a um, generalized eigen decomposition on the data to compare this time window and this time window. And if you disagree with my selected time windows, then that's great because, first of all, you have the code, so you can do whatever you want. Uh, but in a moment, I'm going to ask one of you to uh, ask all of you to to give me a suggestion for two different time windows. And we're just gonna we're gonna play around a little bit and see what else we can find in the data. So uh, pre-stimulus period to uh, the post-stimulus uh, reversal period. That's what we're going to uh, compute the time window for. Okay. So then let's see. So here we compute the covariance matrices, and now this is conceptually exactly the same as what we did earlier, but. Uh, in implementation, it's slightly different. And that's because now we have um, 200 trials. So we are, um, so we have this for loop that goes over all 200 trials. And then we get the data from each trial separately. So here is for the S matrix, we get the CSD data from all channels, um, not all time points, just in this particular time window. And this variable comes from, uh, yeah, from basically finding the indices in the time vector that um, that correspond to these time points in milliseconds. So, um, so a selected time window and then just this trial. And then uh, this stuff is the same. So we mean center 
and compute the, uh, the data times its transpose divided by the number of time points. And then you can see it's S equals itself plus this stuff. So we are adding, uh, yeah, so we start off with these matrices being all zeros, and then we're adding to it the covariance matrix from each trial individually. And same thing with R, this is exactly the same code, just this variable is different. Okay, so let's run that code. And now this is pretty interesting. So these two matrices, first of all, they don't look as structured as the, the EEG uh, covariance matrices did. And that basically tells us that um, there's, there's a lot more like individual variability um, in the different channels. They look quite similar here at the trial average, but this is the average over all the trials. And this is the covariance separately for each individual trial. And then all of those 200 covariance matrices are, are um, averaged together. Um, and then it's also, it's, uh, yeah, it's also clear that there are some striking differences between S and R. Okay, so um, generalized eigenvalue composition, this is now nothing new. It's all the same code as before. Um, just, you know, some, some minor modifications. So here we get the results. So here is the eigen spectrum. So you see that uh, there's one big component that pops out and uh, the rest of these are, you know, just sort of uh, sorted noise. And I don't know what's going on with this thing. It's one really tiny component. It's probably because what is the, the rank of these data? And so this is, uh, beyond our discussion here, but if you're if you've taken linear algebra before, then the, the this is a rank fourteen matrix, which is sixteen by sixteen. So um, it's actually um, there, there's there isn't you know although there's um, sixteen channels in the data, there's only fourteen dimensions of information. So we're going to get a couple of weird things happen here. Anyway, this is the um, uh, like the, the topographical plot. So before with EEG, we could like visualize the topographical plot. Here it's the same concept, but we only have a one dimensional signal. So um, basically you can see that these channels and these channels are really not contributing to the uh, component at all. These channels are contributing uh, in one direction and these channels are contributing in the other direction. And really this component is mainly driven by this thing. It's also pretty neat just to look at this. It almost looks like, you know, a, a difference of Gaussians. You know, if you take a Gaussian and then um, like a narrow Gaussian and a lower amplitude wider Gaussian, and you subtract the two, then you get something that looks like this. I don't know if that's uh, that's meaningful, but anyway. Um, now it looks like uh, so. What I'm plotting here is the component time series in blue, and the average of channels six and seven here in uh, in orange. Now it looks like they are they are sign flipped. And um, this th th there's a longer discussion here, but it turns out that the sign of an eigenvector is um, is is arbitrary. And computers don't really know how to assign a sign to it because eigenvectors are um, they point along some direction and it doesn't actually matter if you point forwards or, or backwards. So there's principal ways of, of dealing with this. But anyway, so you can see that uh, the component time series looks an awful lot like channels six and seven. Um, and that's no surprise given this map. Um, and uh, But it, it does look like the component time series exaggerates the gamma, so highlights the gamma response here. And um, yeah, sort of, uh, it doesn't really do a whole lot back here. And uh, yes, mo mostly the differences are in this range. Look, this looks a little bit different here as well. So if we would do a time frequency analysis of the component time series, like what we were doing last week, then maybe we would find um, stronger gamma in the component compared to just this uh, time series. Now, it's also not surprising looking at these data, the channels six and seven, this is one, two, three, four, five, uh, Oh, wait, no, sorry, it's kind of here. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's basically the average of these two channels here. So what do you guys think? Neat? Boring?
Pretty neat. It's pretty cool. All right. So now this is the, the audience particip participation part. So what I'm going to do is rerun all the code I just ran, but change these um, two time windows. So this is for um, S and R. So um, hopefully it'll be two different people giving me different answers, and we'll see if we can get some confusing results. So type in two numbers for the R matrix. It can be anywhere, let's say, I don't know, at least 150 or 200 milliseconds, something like that. What do you want to see for the R matrix? One to 1.2, great. The R matrix is one to 1.2. So that's going to be this time window here. It's basically going to be the stimulus offset response. And then someone else, not Clemens, someone else give me, all right, 0.1 to 0.3, great. Thanks, guys, 0.1 to 0.3. OK, so generate this plot again. So now what we are going to do is um, ask for a spatial filter that maximally separates this period from this, or I should say it the other way, this period, which is S, from this period, which is R. So this is the stimulus onset response, and this is the stimulus offset response. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, any of you guys actually worked with um, uh, V1 spiking data or V1 LFP data, like from a, a mouse or rat or a monkey or something? <clears throat> So it turns out that um, you get much, uh, most neurons in V1 have really, really strong responses to stimulus offsets. Uh, although when you look in the literature and in textbooks, everyone talks about the stimulus duration period. <laughs> it, it does make sense, but it's interesting to, to see that the brain cares an awful lot about the disappearance of a uh, stimulus. Anyway, um, okay, great. So let's recreate the covariance matrices. And, uh, oops, did I, oh yeah, I did rerun this, yeah. So rerun this, uh, recreate the covariance matrices, um, rerun the generalized eigen decomposition. Oh, sorry, before, there was one more thing I wanted to say. This result, uh, this is not the new result, this is from uh, the previous window. This is also telling us that these two channels are the most discriminative between this time window and the, and the pre-stimulus baseline. So these two channels are the best ways to separate. You know, they they show the strongest difference between uh, the all, all. You know, out of all the channels, these two show the most for this versus this. Okay. Anyway, uh, now let's plot the results. So this looks pretty uh, wild. So we don't. So it looks like there's multiple components in here. Um, we don't see something like what we saw before, where there's like one really big component. Now. There's two ways to interpret this result. One way to interpret this result is that there are multiple components that separate, multiple distinct, multiple, you know, separable features of the data, patterns in the data that separate the stimulus onset response from the stimulus offset response. Another way to interpret it is that the responses are basically the same. And what we're looking at here is mostly uh, just kind of uh, uh, noise that we're just kind of overfitting. It's not really noise, but we're overfitting the data a bit. So without doing any inferential statistics, we don't have a way of distinguishing between those two hypotheses. But so here we see the results also pretty strong for uh, channels six and seven. And the component time series, that's this is pretty neat actually. So now it looked like the component time series attenuated the gamma response, right? So we see less gamma. And also, you know, here there's there's really no gamma in the component time series, whereas before there was a stronger uh, 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 gamma. So let's see. I would like to do something else, uh, which is to show you what the second component looks like. So this is. So here I create uh, the component time series. So for the the largest component. And what I'm going to do now is say uh, v comma two. So v is the eigenvectors matrix. So comma two, and here for the forward model, I'll say comma two. So now I'm going to show us the time series um, of this component here. So right now we're looking at this one, 
And now I'm going to show us this one. So let's rerun this code. And the smart thing to do is to put this in a different figure. So let's go to figure nine. And yeah, that's it. OK. So uh, now this component uh, looks kind of shitty, right? I mean, you do see it doesn't look like pure noise. Uh, there is some, you know, there, 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 there does seem to be some temporal structure in here, but um, overall, it, it doesn't look that interesting. Now, maybe if we were to do a time frequency analysis of this component, we would see that there are some interesting spectral responses that are happening over the different trials that is not really visible in the uh, in the uh, the trial average, the time domain trial average, but um, yeah. Otherwise, I don't know. Sort of looks OK, I guess. Let me see. So again, this is the sort of thing. Maybe you know, it, it, I could imagine if we were to do some statistical evaluation, maybe the threshold would be here. Or maybe it would be here. This might be a significant component. Let's try now, out of curiosity, I'll do component 3. Rerun that code, redo the plotting. Ah, that's pretty neat, actually. Component three looks much more uh, like, uh, I don't know, plausible. It seems less noisy than component two. Now that makes me think that what's driving component two is something in the data that is not phase lock. So it's um, temporally jittered over the different trials. And that's why it ended up being a larger component than component three. You know, the, the power ratio is larger than for this one. Uh, but the the ERP for component two looks pretty noisy. Now remember when we did uh, when we created the covariance matrices here, it was the covariance matrix of each trial separately, <clears throat> and then averaged together. So there could be a lot of things happening in the single trial data, like what we saw here, or what I was discussing about here. Things happening in the single trial data that are temporally jittered. Um, that so that you know have slightly different timing on different trials. So when you average over trials, you don't really see those dynamics. So it could be that that's what was happening with uh, component two. <laughs> of course, you know this is all just um, like uh, um, post hoc blowing hot air out of my ass here because I don't actually know any of this for sure. But these are certainly you know things that I am thinking about, uh, and you know. If we had another hour, we could we could spend some time going over that. Let's see. I think um, it's almost time. We have a few more minutes. I, let, I would like to do this experiment once more. So now let's start again with the R matrix. So someone give me some other pair of numbers that we'll use for R. No requests, just one other pair of numbers. Anyone? Nathan. Nathan wants minus 0.2 to 0. So that's going to be also a pre stamp. And then someone other than Nathan, give me a time window for S. Andy says 0.7 to 0.9. All right, thanks. So this is like um, the gamma time window that's after this initial um, stimulus onset. So you can see there's like this kind of, uh, yeah, it's sort of um, like an initial response. And then you almost get into like a steady state response here where there, there's some transient event and then there's something that's a little bit uh, more kind of long lasting here. Okay, so that's gonna be pretty interesting. So let's do that, recompute the covariance matrices, and redo the eigen decomposition. And here, I'm, I'm so, uh, I set this back to be uh, the first component. And, ah, now this looks great. So, uh, so thank you, uh, Nathan and Andy, because this worked out really well. Now, this to me, again, you know, we, we can't really make strong claims without doing any kind of uh, inferential statistics, but this to me really looks like there's two big features in the data that are linearly separable. So they, they behave differently from each other and which are clearly separable from this, which I would call the noise spectrum of the data. 
So here's what the first component looks like, which uh, basically looks really similar to what we saw before. But uh, the first time window that we used was longer. Um, so maybe we, we were kind of missing out on some stuff. So let's see, now I'm going to set this to figure nine. And I'm going to look at the second component. So we run this code. We run this code. And then we see this is huge. Look at this. This gamma thing got much bigger. It's also interesting to see that these are driven by different channels. So this was component one. Um, and this is really driven by channels six and seven. Here's component two. And that's really driven by channels yeah, nine and 10. So going back here. It looks like there's two components. Uh, we see this feature and this feature, but it's not only these two channels, right? I mean, each every component is a weighted combination of all of the channels. So all the channels are contributing, but uh, these are contributing more. And here, these are contributing the most. So this is pretty interesting. Also, I think that, you know, I mean, this is interesting from a signal processing perspective, but I think from a neural perspective, this is also interesting because Again, you know, we would have to do like a bit more data to, to say things really confidently. But to me, the the suggestion that this versus this is telling me is that there are two different neural popula two distinct neural populations in V1 that are um, spatially partially overlapping. They are both producing gamma oscillations, uh, but they are producing different um, gamma oscillations. And uh, yeah, I mean, it could be that the frequencies are slightly different. Uh, the, the spatial topographies, the, the spatial origins are certainly a little bit different. So yeah, it could be sort of two competing gamma networks um, that are uh, that are um, yeah, kind of uh, uh, fighting for uh, for for overall gamma response. So thank you, Nathan, Andy. That turned out to be even more interesting and insightful than uh, than I had imagined. And by the way, this is not the sort of thing you would be able to get from just doing time frequency analysis of the raw channel data. It's only from this um, spectral decomposition. It would also be interesting to you know, test if, uh, if running an ICA on the data would give you a similar kind of uh, decomposition. But uh, yeah, but this is pretty neat. All right. so. Any um, questions about uh, these results or about the lecture in general? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for reminding me. Uh, I guess I got so enthusiastic about the, uh, the, the code that I forgot to take a break. More people are typing. So um, I started the lecture with um, the results of the survey that I sent out. Um, so yeah, 12 of you responded. So thank you to the 12 of you who responded. Um, uh, I'll get to your question in a second, Nathan. So basically the, the winner was um, multivariate cross-frequency coupling. So I will send you another email um, in a few days, but basically next week is going to be an extension of um, this week. So today we talked about like general spatial filtering Next week is going to be an application of spatial filtering um, in uh, cross-frequency coupling. OK, so your question is, what is the last node on the upper left graph? Right, so um, this is basically getting into the, the joint null space of these two covariance matrices. So without getting uh, too deep into the, um, the, the, the linear algebra, we have 16 channels of data. And so the covariance matrix is 16 by 16. Um, so the covariance matrix is this um, matrix that's living in a 16-dimensional space. But it turns out if you compute the rank of that matrix, it's only 14. So that means that although it's technically 16 dimensions, two of those dimensions are completely flat. There's no information in two out of 16 dimensions. And uh, so, so when you, if you think about the data in those dimension, in that high dimensional space as being this sort of cloud of, of data points, then the S data and R data are, are two different clouds that are mostly overlapping. 
but there's at least one dimension, or it looks like there's one dimension where um, neither S nor R have any extension into that dimension or any, any variability along that dimension. Um, so this is basically like the, the joint null space of those two matrices where yeah, it's, it's like a, a black hole that's like sucking in, the, the, there's no return once you get in here. I, I don't know if that's a sensible or, or totally incomprehensible uh, thing, but basically when you, when you look at these eigenspectra, you just want to focus on the, the top couple of values and ignore everything else to the right. All right. Well, um, I enjoyed uh, going through this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Um, have a nice week. It's, we're still going to get nice weather for the next couple of days. So um, I don't know. Don't study too much. <laughs> Forget to go outside a little bit uh, because then after this, it's going to be like six months of cold, wet darkness.